from an album titled Dance of the Infidel. That is Michelle and Dege Ocello on bass along with an ensemble that she called the Spirit Music Jamia. And uh, just beautiful, beautiful compositions on this album. And for those people who do not understand that Michelle and Deggio Cello embraces all of her musical influences in many uh, beautiful, beautiful ways. And if you look over her catalog of uh, releases, you will get the funk. You will get the go-go influence from our native DC. You will get the 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 uh, folky and and uh, you know uh, the tribute album to Nina Simone. She's given us so many different shades of black music and culture that um, it really really is a beautiful thing to watch unfold. And so that song features vocals from Sabina of the group Brazilian Girls, and it's called Aquarium, and just talks about this kind of futility sometimes. We think things are pretty and we want to preserve them and have them for ourselves. But what does that mean for the object of that affection being boxed in and held back in many different ways? Uh, So it's a sad song, but it's funky and it's uh, wonderful as we continue our celebration of Jazz Appreciation Month on this final Friday in April. And of course, we are coming at you live from the uh, beautiful environs of Duwafe Holistic Hair Care. And, and it smells so good in here right now. It's hard yeah. for me to even concentrate. <laughs> and the Sable Collective uh, near the corner of 22nd and Allegheny. It is our spring forward membership drive and so we're inviting you out to especially if you've never been here to check out the beauty that exists within the walls of this wonderful wonderful cultural and entrepreneurial space and as we continue our conversation on the air today we are also going to expand our conversation about black film and television and other cultural concerns mike d is in the house for this week's edition of real black radio Stephanie, yes, you you did you, you did not lie. This is I have not been to Duafe since they made their migration. Uh-huh. I'm always always a part of North Philly, but yeah. but a little f- further deep in the hood, actually right down the street from where I live. So. Uh huh. But uh, yeah, the scent. And then yeah. Michelle and Dege Ocello. That's right. We're I we're feeling we're feeling super candle, black right now. Candles and frankincense. Blackity black right now. That's you need the poor bath. And, <laughs> if I had hair, I would definitely line up an appointment. Um. But you know, as always, and and actually, actually, it's two. We're uh, one degree of separation away from our next guest. Yes. Well, actually, two in, in one way. Uh, one, um, Ava DuVernay has braids <laughs> yeah. or dreads or dreads. Whatever, dreads yes. Excuse me. And when locks. she locks, when she comes to Philly, she she has had them uh, worked on by by the kind yes. of folks here. I know that for a fact. Not her regular person, but when she's in Philly, she's she's made she comes here. to Sarita and and um, also Michelle. Does the soundtrack for Queen Sugar? So yes, and uh, with us on the line, the incidental music, as we say, uh, d- with us on the line is C. Fitz, who is the director of the nineteenth release from Array. Woohoo! Jules Catch One. Welcome to Real Black Radio. Indeed, welcome, C. Fitz. F- Fitz. Okay. Fitz to celebrate Jules Catch One. Yes. Okay. Now, now we're back in. So, yeah, welcome. And you, and you prefer Fitz, is what I'm yes. told. Fitz, Fitz is so, great. Perfect. Thanks for having welcome me. Welcome, Fitz. So, so the movie it, it debuts everywhere on Netflix um, on May first, but it's on a tour throughout the country. I think it's screening tonight in New York and, and tomorrow in LA. Do I have that right, or as we speak? Um, it's, or, it's, or in, it's in New York. Gary, Indiana. Yep, May second, Gar- third, and fourth. It'll be in Harlem, which will be a fantastic celebration. Ah. In the Roth space okay, and then, there by Image Nation Cinema. Yay! I love them. Yes, and Gary, right. Indiana tonight, and, and and you have a big LA premiere coming up as well. So we should check the Array Now website for that. But let folks know about this movie, which I which I happened to see and I loved. Yes, it took me eight years to make, but it, it doesn't compare to uh, forty two years that the documentary covers of this amazing pioneer and activist, Jewel Tice Williams. And all the work that she did. She's a club owner of Catch One for 42 years. And uh, the big difference with Catch One was Jewel allowed the doors open to everybody. And back in the day, um, you know, it was very hard if you were black, if you were female, to actually get into some of the clubs. 
um, even in West Hollywood. But Jules Catch One was different. She allowed everybody in with without hassle, harassment, and three IDs. And, uh, <laughs> and it became a, a huge international mecca over the years. And, yeah, it's incredible. Uh, one one person, uh, it, it, follow, it follows, it's a doc, it follows interviews with everybody then at the closing unfortunately it, it, sh- it ended in 2015 but one of the one of the guests Kurt, uh, said this is as close to Studio 54 as I'm going to get I mean the LA light, nightlife scene can you speak to that all the amazing talent that perf- that went through on that stage and and contributes to the soundtrack of this film yeah the soundtrack uh, is definitely something I worked really hard at and it was so important because in the film there's amazing artists like Evelyn Champagne King who talks about her song Shame and as an example that was really important to Big Catch patrons uh, during the 70s, 80s and 90s because a a lot of them were shamed by their families and friends and and co-workers and Catch One was a place where everyone was welcome and as far as all the celebrities, boy the list is long it went from Sylvester uh, Thelma Houston's mm-hmm. in our film and talks about Don't Leave Me This Way. She has a very unique Catch One story about that, how it was the first time she heard Don't Leave Me This Way, her Grammy Award winning mm. single at Catch One, and uh, all the way up through Madonna. Madonna uh, came in in the late 90s, and she used to dance at Catch One. And she held her music album opening party there. She was a big catch one fan uh not only on the dance floor but but it held some parties there too and it, there's a whole lot of history that went through there as far as the artists and and patrons that's a beautiful thing well i, I gotta jump in here because I, I need you to know that i am one of the people who will go down swinging with the ship when we talk about the power of disco um that i i wanted to be donna summer when I was little, <laughs> now you not just be like her. I wanted to be Donna Summer, and the idea of not only being able to capture this history, but the blood, sweat, and tears that are involved in being a documentarian. Um, can can you share some of that with our audience? Because you know, I talk so often with people about um, what the the compulsion is to capture stories in as much real time as you possibly can and to share this with a larger audience and you've already mentioned it took you eight years to make this film so what what was the driving force and what kept you going over eight years to make sure the story was told well i think once you meet your subject uh you fall in love with it as a filmmaker and it was the first day that I met Jewel. I was uh, doing a two to three minute piece on her because she was winning an award for a place that I was um, directing a, the, the charity little film and when I first met her I was like wow. I was standing on the property. She was in her clinic which was right next door to the nightclub that she later made and I was like we have to do a documentary on you. There's just so much history as I call it, it was like an unwritten textbook of Los Angeles, of the communities and of the organizations and the nightclub and all the patrons that went through there. And and it needed to be told. And that was from day one. And I never, I guess in my heart, I never thought that I would finish it. There were definitely tough times over the eight years where you're scraping together funds and also trying to keep the music that should be kept in a film like this that covers 40 years. We yeah. have everything from um, the disco era all the way through Andre Day's Rise Up, which is our hero story, hero song at the end. And all of that was really important to me to, to really shine a light on all of this history that, you know, would have gone unfold. And there's thousands of people that know Jewel Tice Williams because she affected thousands of people and she helped change history. But now, because of a Ray and Ava DuVernay, we get to tell the world about this story and I think that that's so important. And that was really at the root of my storytelling and why I guess I didn't stop um, until I finished it. And fortunately, <laughs> you know, we have that representation through places like Array that, that really recognize that these stories need to be told. 
Yeah, without question. Uh, uh, Jules Catch One, owned for 42 years by independently by a black woman. Yeah. And now mm -hmm. the film being distributed by a black owned uh, film distribution company. So, um, you know, it's super exciting. Now, it's, it is Female Filmmaker Friday and it's Freestyle Friday. So you yeah, mentioned I Sylvester. I got to I got <laughs> you make me feel mighty real. Yeah, I gotta get that, you. That's in that movie, Mighty Feel. Like, <laughs> I'm telling you, well, no, I got, I got. I, no, that's a running gag. I, see, yeah, I was gonna say, so you gotta understand, Fitz, that you know we we I, we tell Mike all the time that you know we appreciate everything Shame. that he does in the area of filmmaking, but when it comes to song and dance, that he should leave it to other folks. There's some, yeah, oh, well, I'm, I, you're not. I, I can't. I can enjoy the movie, the music. Nothing. <laughs> I can enjoy the music in your film. Some of the fashion in this film oh, yes. is outrageous. And be. some of the people that um, populate the movie besides Jules, I mean, it's just, it's like a homecoming and I'm sure a lot of people connect with it. When when you've taken this movie on the road and it's won lots of awards, what, what has been the response? I, you know, it's been a huge gift. We have been able to screen, fortunately, all the way from Los Angeles where it's our hometown and you know, sold out theaters where Jules been there and we've gotten standing ovations. I mean, how, what a glorious gift. All the way to London. Um, we got in the BFI Film Festival because of the music and the story. And, and again, you know, standing ovation. And I think what's really amazing, the, the music, the soundtrack is wonderful. It, it's populated with celebrities that gifted us their, their specific interviews that relate back to the Catch One. But what's the best gift that I've gotten as a filmmaker is that from all walks of life, at the end of the film, they've watched the history, they've gotten a history lesson that was untold. Mm -hmm. But by watching Jewel and all her work as an entrepreneur, as, as a black woman standing up and opening those doors for 42 years, they feel inspired yes. to do something more with their life you know, to make a little change in their own backyard, to reach out to their neighbor, no matter who they are, by watching the film. And that's been one of the best gifts that I've gotten back by doing the film. And it's been tremendous and amazing. And, and now with Array and the distribution, I'm just so excited to share it with more people. It's, it's just been wonderful. Well, I have not yet had the benefit of seeing the film, but everything that you have told us about it today means that I am going to pull up my popcorn and sit down yes. and dance and make a mess on, in my living room. Uh, dance Shame! <laughs> <laughs> taking in taking in this wonderful, wonderful history and celebrating the idea of people having safe spaces to be themselves and to yes. and to just bask in the glory of being in community, because that really is what it's about at the end of the day, not having to look over your shoulder, feeling like you have found your people, your tribe and having a place to exercise that uh, for 42 years is an amazing, amazing gift that you've been able to give us in film. Thank you. Yeah, it's been an honor. Uh, she really did create a space and then allowed, because it's such a big space, the building was such a big space, a place to organize for other organizations. And that was so important, too. So thank you. It's been no. an honor. Shed some light. No, um, we're, before I let you go, I, I am curious. Uh, the, the, the Catch One has closed uh, three years now. And um, part of it is like she she carried that torch for a long time for a great many people made made it a lot easier for the next generation. But in terms of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, you know, what what has become of that space and and where that neighborhood in general? That space actually now is a new club, um, which is nice in the film. You know, Jewel is really struggling with selling it in 2015. And she feels like it's going to be turned into condos, and she's really having a hard time with letting it go, obviously, after four decades. And um, these new owners came in. It's called Union, and they've made it into a house music type of nightclub. We've actually held a few parties there for the Catch One film, and, and that's been nice. Um, Jules nonprofit um, health clinic, the Village Health Foundation, was right next door. And she sold all of that property in 2015. But what's been wonderful is Jewel still works to this day as a healer 
in at the Village mm. Health Foundation, which she then rented the next door building. So she's still in that neighborhood, and that's super important to her patients and, and also to Jewel because she could really go anywhere. She's an amazing healer, and she could go make more money in maybe a different community, but she's stuck with that community, and she's stuck with her patients. True entrepreneur, and um, that was really important. But we're, we're looking to make it a national landmark, that building um, on Pico and Norton. And the producers and hopefully this film will help do that. Love it. So May 1st, it, it, it starts on Netflix and it's uh, traveling around the country. So thank you, Fitz, for taking I know it's early where you are. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> no you have a whole problem. week full of premieres. So yeah, uh, please, if, if... Give us a search. Jules Catch One on Netflix May 1st. We're really excited. Thank you, Array and Ava Dernay. Thank you. And if you're in any of the cities where it's actually playing live, please go because there's parties, things tied into all the screenings. It's really a celebration. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to take our first commercial break of today's segment. But we've got so much more great conversation and information coming at you on this week's edition of Real Black Radio. The TGIF edition of The Source is coming at you live, a special live broadcast as a part of Word Radio's Spring Forward Membership Drive. We're at Dewafe Holistic Hair Care and the Sable Collective at near the corner of 22nd and Allegheny. Come on out and be a part of the celebration and all of the wonderful black beauty and self-care and upliftment that is happening and it smells great (laughs) we'll be right back (laughs) there are few things ladies and gentlemen that i love more than big band music and it doesn't make a difference who is the conductor but there are so many young talents in the jazz industry that are now embracing the big band sound and sharing it with a larger audience. That was the Roy Hargrove big band from the album Emergence and the song was titled Mambo for Roy. So that's him wailing on his own trumpet uh, along with his ensemble in that particular composition. It is the final Friday in April, which is National Jazz Appreciation month and of course Philadelphia is one of the seats of jazz music for the world and so we want to embrace that and encompass that in today's special live broadcast as we celebrate our spring forward membership drive with this live broadcast as we are coming at you from Dewafe Holistic Hair Care and the Sable Collective near the corner of 22nd and Allegheny in lovely North Philadelphia. I'm Stephanie Renee joined by Mike D for hey, this week's edition of Real Black Radio. Hey there, and some CB radio guys. What, BJ and the Bears on there too? I hear a little <laughs> static. Breaker, breaker, one nine. That could that could be our next guest <laughs> on the line, which is uh, I'm really excited about our next guest. Yes. Uh, Eric Jerome Dickey uh, has been writing novels, thrillers, love, celebrating black love, romance, sex, thrillers for for the longest time, and now he's got a new book, and I'm going to hold it up for the people watching it's called uh, bad men and wicked women yes and, uh, and he joins us now on the line how you doing today i'm doing well how are y'all doing breaker breaker very well and i was telling mike during the break that one of my best friends has been uh working and editing with you for a long time melody guy so it's good to oh, have yeah. everybody everything all together yes yeah, one of my one, one of my pen roommates oh wow i didn't so, know that she didn't tell me that. i didn't know that at all wow <laughs> small world well I and I, I guess Go ahead. I'm going Eric, to go ahead. Well, I mean, it's a small world. I, I first became acquainted with you when I was out in L.A. Uh, you know, one of the first movies. Well, my screening series is based around and in, influenced in some ways by uh, Doughboy's Dozens. Oh, my know, the gosh. coffee shop. Are you serious? Yeah. So one, <laughs> one oh of the. Oh, my gosh, man. Yeah. That's, man. that's why I saw uh, Cappuccino. We showed Cappuccino. We had uh, Craig yeah. Ross Skype in. So oh we got a lot man, to talk yeah, about. No, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you just took me way back, man. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, well, let God, that let that energy God. out. I mean, I, gosh, I used to go back then. You saw him around all the time, and uh, back then I was just Eric Dickey, and nobody <laughs> knew who I was. And I was and I was a big fan, and uh, you know, as, as much as I could, because I think I was living out in Phillips Ranch, which at the time, which would have been. About a forty-five minute hour drive, no traffic. <laughs> mm. But but I was always that. I used to I used to live out in the in the burbs, and I would come out to L.A. 
uh, and just stay all day so I could be around blackness. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I would, you know, I would, I would get my eats on at uh, Stevie's on the Strip. I would uh, hang out in Lamert Park, which is uh, which is adjacent to the area that many call the Black Beverly Hills, which I talk yes. about in, in this book as well. And you know, it's at nighttime, man. You know, be down in Lamert Park, uh, not you know, in the same Doughboy vicinity at uh, yeah. at uh, Comedy Act Theater, uh, Fifth Street Dicks, uh, Lucy Florence, and Doughboys, man. It's a huge, huge part of. The uh, African American black culture here in LA, mm-hmm. man. Uh, yeah, well, poor, poor, poor little, poor little liquor out for Eugene. Uh, he passed away, but hey, that's, okay, I didn't, yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to say that part, but yeah, because when I, when I heard about it, it really, wow, I, I just, you know, it's what? just. I, I don't want to take you there. There, I'm just saying we have a degree of separation. We, we, but if we have time, we talk about cappuccino, but because that's that's my first introduction to you. But oh, okay. but before we but before we get done, I mean, the job at hand is black men, wicked women. Yeah. In hardcover, Dutton Books. Tell us about, it, please. Oh wow! Uh, I, and the same novel, the majority of it takes place in the areas that we just spoke about. Uh, Ken Swift actually lives in Lamert Park. He is what I have called in the novel an enforcer. He's not a hitman, but he's the guy that they send. Somebody owes you some money, a bad guy. This is the guy they send to go have a conversation with him. Uh, A lot of times it goes nice, a lot of times it goes sideways. And in this novel, I think when we enter enter Ken, Ken is like 43. He's been in this like 40, uh, like 20 years. uh, he goes. He goes to have a conversation with the man in in Pasadena, and everything goes wrong. That's a. I don't want to give stuff away, but that's a huge part of the novel. And it's set in. Uh, he has a sidekick, a Ghanaian sidekick, who is just. He can. He can, he, he charms the clothes off women with the wink of an eye. <laughs> He's that kind of guy, you know. Uh, and uh, and in his job, he charms this guy's wife right in front of this guy's face and mm. it's a guy who already don't like black people. Mm. Right. So, And he's doing it to mess with them. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, everything... It, 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 oh, gosh. It, it's... Uh, at, at times, it's very Tarantino-ish. I mean, the, uh, <laughs> it, again, it's in the time that we live in now. I deal with pretty much every social issue. I don't deal with it, but it's present in that world. They live in a black community, so as they park yeah. their cars, I mean, you know, sisters were handing out pamphlets from the, from the new Black Panther Party. There's stuff up about gentrification. Uh, you know, I, his, his, uh, his girlfriend is a singer, and she's got a gig at the Rams game. Everybody wants to know, you're going to take a knee? What you going to do? You can't be swindling mm-hmm. at this. So she's still in that press. You know, she just want to sing the song and get exposure. But right. She's trapped in the middle of the moment, the politics of the moment. If I do this, I lose. If I do that, I never get hired again. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's um, very well, very timely. But at the same time, it still has that that noise feel about it. You know. Okay. Yeah. He's a hitman. Well, he's not a hitman. He's a he's an enforcer. Things gonna things are gonna get bad. And at the same time. It's a strange daughter shows up in the at, at, at the start. She hasn't, hasn't seen her dad in ten years. She knows what he's he's done, and she brings that to the table to blackmail him for fifty thousand dollars. So Oof, he's dealing with that, that's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, you know, and uh, you know, it's one of those things. You know how people see you. You drive a particular car. You dress a particular way. And they think, okay, he must got money. <laughs> he ain't one of those guys. He's living job to job, but his but his daughter doesn't know him. She comes to black man. She well, you you must be rich. <laughs> you right, right, right. Well, you know th- this kind of this also brings us to the discipline of what it takes to be a novelist in the way that you have been successfully for years. And, and talk a little bit about that process for you, because I don't think you know. I, in the same way that we have to teach our young people who see uh, their favorite um, musical artist as yeah. a celebrity, and 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 how you know they think that it's instant fame and. Instant instant money, the discipline oh, God, of writing books and how you get paid to write books and make them successful is something that a lot of people are not necessarily prepared to do. 
Why not? I think pe- people see the end result. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I get people who come to events and uh, they say they want to, you know, be a writer. But what they really want, they want the book signing. They want they want that picture in a newspaper. They want to do this interview that I'm doing now. But right. they don't see that. You know, it, you you know, you you work ten, fifteen years before you before anybody took notice. But the thing about it, you're in something. I was writing, taking classes at UCLA. Post my engineer, I was a software. I was worked in software development. I, I, I worked uh, aerospace for almost ten years before I made this career transition. And then mm-hmm. when I came into this, it was something that interested me, something at the, that I wanted to do. I took it to ground zero. I went back to U. I went to UCLA. I took class writing classes. The intro to everything. <laughs> intro to short stories, intro to writing mystery, intro to this. So I spent a lot of a lot of my I, I spent time and money because uh, you can't expect people to invest more in you than you're willing to invest in yourself, be it time mm-hmm. or money. And I did it all silently. I didn't talk about it. Uh, I was about it. I mean, it was what I did. And uh, I geez. Years of that, getting through the, the program at UCLA, the extension program for, for creative writing, uh, which was fantastic. I mean, it, it was for me, it was just fantastic being in that environment around writers who didn't necessarily write <clears throat> the same type of stuff I was writing. You, I could be in a room with 12 people, and you got 12 different types of stories. You know, you yeah. got 12 individuals, but it, I learned a lot from reading stuff that I wouldn't uh, ordinarily read. Uh, staying with the process. The big part of even with the education is putting your butt in the chair and trying to be creative with the rules that they gave you. You learn the rules so you can break the rules. That's always been my thing about it. Because once you know how to break the rules, you, now I know how to tell a story the way I want to tell a story, and it can still make sense. Uh, yeah. Because writing, you're still in communication. This is a, to me, this is a form of communication. I mean, so because as people read your story, it has to have a logical progression. It has to make sense. Uh, it has to come together in the end. And in some way, people have to be left in a suspenseful way, in a good way, or you concluded a story in a way that the majority of the readers are going to be satisfied. That's why this is all the stuff that you practice at, work at fail at, get better at, <laughs> that folks don't see. They get the yeah. end product. They get the book that I did, or any writer's done. I mean, and you think that, oh, you must have did this last week, because it took, yeah. it takes them two days to read it. They don't realize it took you a year to write it. Yeah. And, well, you're- and that's, that's the part that a lot of people who want to write don't want to go through. They don't want to sit with something. I you're too- in, in uh, Atlanta come to me with that. It's like, so if I start on this journey and I start to do this, will I be guaranteed? And I was like, no, there, there, there's no guarantee. I didn't. Right. I couldn't have predicted this. I didn't know this was going to happen. You put a book out, you don't know if people are going to buy it or not. You can advertise, put billboards up, put it on the truck, tweet. It, it doesn't mean people are going to buy it, you know, because then all of a sudden right. something catches fire that nobody's heard of. By someone right. we've never heard of, because Eric, hold, hold it right, hold it right there. I want we're up against a break, but I would love oh, for you to, if you could come back, because um, I'm interested about the business of of selling black books in okay. 2018, and also this is Avengers Infinity Wars comes out today. You're involved with Marvel in a, a very interesting way. I would love people to know about that. Can you hang on? Oh, I'll be here. Okay, thanks. Excellent. All right, we're going to take our final commercial break of today's segment to come back and continue our conversation with Eric Jerome Dickey on this week's edition of Real Black Radio. Hang tight, folks. I have to sigh because as much as I love Chris and all of his music, that voice that you hear in this song is of the late, great Vesta. Uh, But for those of you who need to beef up your Philadelphia music repertoire or your jazz and funk as it relates to all of the music that's being shared. That is Philadelphia's own Christian McBride from the album A Family Affair with a tune titled Or So You Thought featuring the voice of the late great Vesta. Beautiful, beautiful. I don't don't know why I'm thinking of uh, Christian something. He was just awarded something but it 
made me also think he that, wins all kinds of everything. Yeah, I don't Grammys I, and and yeah. and lifetime achievement awards here in the city of Philadelphia. He's fabulous, now, and if you get a chance to see him live, you owe it to yourself to make that happen. I'm late on it, but I, it reminds me we'll have to talk about the list of the uh, Grammy, like the Library of Congress recordings ah. that were admitted uh harry belafonte got admitted and yes and there's some new rap records and things too indeed but we want to make sure that we get back to our guest who is holding on the line eric jerome dickey and he is the author of a brand new book that we are sharing about today bad men and wicked women and mike you had some questions before we went into yeah, that last well, break well um eric it's uh great to have you i mean again i've always I've followed your, your career path forever but you know, one one thing again in in terms of modeling, my when I came back to Philly, I, uh, film was starting to grow in mm-hmm. a very interesting way, where there's a lot of independent black filmmakers. And at the same time, here in Philadelphia, we had places like Crimson Moon, a very Afrocentric community. And um, I remember a lot of black authors, a lot a lot of Philly black authors, especially they they sort of there was also an independent network of black booksellers that seemed yeah. to help. Yeah catapult yeah. your names into the the world the people's consciousness i mean can you yeah. and i remember like even like terry mcmillan they said like that networking of just having a book tour a place black owned book tour you could talk to one another about what the contract rates were and different things like that i mean how can you speak about that that part of the come up uh and, well it was I that, that, that was a huge part of it because i think if we go back uh I'll go back to say Terry McMillan because you had a lot of black booksellers who were hand selling her books. Uh, BB, uh, BB Moore Campbell, Tim McElroy Anza, myself, Lolita Files, Kimberly, Kimberly Lawson Roby. And that made the huge difference in uh, all of our careers. I mean, we could have, back then, we could do a book tour from coast to coast for three weeks and only hit independent black bookstores. And mm-hmm. every store you walked into, it was like walking into the home of extended family in the sense of they knew who you were, they knew your book, they were happy to see you, and uh, it was all, and it was just, it was like just going from family reunion to family reunion across, across the state. Uh, that increased numbers, that increased, that increased sales, and what happened was uh, a lot of our products sold not that first week, that second week, but over the course of the year, we were always selling. And when there was money to be made, other mm-hmm. folks want to put their hands in the pot. So then you start getting uh, requests from a lot of the mainstream stores. And it's kind of funny. You'll be three years into your career going like, well, they've never wanted me there before. Well, why do they want me there now? And it, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But but it also in terms of like uh, well, Elin Harris is another name and and oh, yeah, here in yeah, in, yeah. Um, Elin, in Philly. Elin started out selling books out of the trunk of his car. He sold books out of the trunk of his car, and he, he had a, de- a degree. Uh, he, he was degreed, uh, worked at IBM, wanted to do a career change, and self published. Sold books out of the trunk of his car to beauty shops to to anybody who would uh, who anybody who would buy one. And I'm blanking out. My guy from Philly went to Central. Uh, Lore of Young Women was one of his movies. Uh, Ty, uh, Omar Tyree, mm-hmm. another one. But I mean, one one of the things I remember talking to the writers were about was when the big mainstream book publishers did come after you've been selling out of, out of your trunk. Everybody knew what everybody else was getting because everybody had the same network. You, uh, what not you mean so far as uh, money wise? What the, what the what we know the prices kind of thing. Like we know and what what, what the, the offers look like. But we, we, we know, well, I've never known what everybody else's offers look like. I never, okay. it never, no, I, just, I've ne- I never have. Okay. Uh, I right, know what some other people, some people would go out and announce uh, okay. what they were getting. Uh, but I, okay. I, I, I was, I was, I, I wasn't necessarily in that group of people who, I was always with the people, whenever we sat down, we talked about the art, how to make what we have better. Uh, because through that, we felt that you know that's how you, uh, that's how you increase sales. That's how you know we didn't want to sound like rappers out there. You know what I mean? Uh, mm-hmm. And there were some people out there who sounded like rappers. I mean, there were some writers out there. They started having, they thought the thing was to get on the mic and talk about they got a beef with another rapper, like it was Langston Hughes and Baldwin back in the '60s, and it it just never really uh, attracted me or made sense to me. You know what I mean? Oh, so those makes perfect, makes perfect the people sense. I, 
Say it again. Makes perfect sense. Now I gotta do my Wakanda Forever sign because oh, I know yes. you're also tied in. Um, over ten years ago, you were involved with the Black Panther and yes, a great graphic oh, novel. Let me, let me say this real quick. And people, when you're doing the Wakanda Forever salute, it's right hand over left, ah. right hand over left. Okay. All right, okay. I'm, I'm watching people do it. I go, that's, that's not it. That's not it. <laughs> over right. That's faking it. It's right hand <laughs> over left. Okay, go ahead. Gotcha. So, I mean, we're, you, but we're you, not doing it for the camera. You, you yes. had an opportunity to reimagine what a relationship between Storm and T'Challa yes, was. No, that was. Yeah, that was nice, man. Uh, uh, at the time, um, uh, Marvel contacted my agent, and my agent contacted me. And, you know, you get this phone call, and they say, yeah, Eric. Marvel just called, want to know if you're interested in doing a comic. And, you know, I'm like 13 books in, and I'm like, are you serious? I, was, <laughs> I grew up on comics, man. It's like one of the first things I wrote when I was uh, 12, 13. Me and three other guys created a comic book. We were in middle school. We only did one copy, one issue. But, you know, hey, it was this, you know, so it took me back to that. And they offered me Captain America and Spider-Man at first to do something evergreen. And then about a week later, they called back with this concept of because uh, Storm and T'Challa were about to get married in the in the Marvel Universe. They wanted this uh, big event, and they asked me to do this backstory. So I, so I did my research, uh, looked at what Chris Claremont had done and what a couple of other people had done. And sort of, they just let me go to do my own thing, you know. So I reimagined um, this section of Storm's life when T'Challa shows up where she is. Because uh, Storm was a street urchin. She was uh, homeless. Her parents were had been killed. Well, had died. And uh, I, I wanted to write her about her. This is before her powers come in. When they're coming in, but she doesn't understand what's going on. I wanted to write about it from a particular perspective that I hadn't seen other writers write about it from. Uh, because her powers are all external. The weather, the this, the that, and it's triggered by mood. So for me, my perspective was, so you probably think this is God talking to you. You don't realize that this power is coming from within you. So that, was, that was my take on it. And uh, brought in an antagonist that Chris Claremont had created, uh, created some ancillary antagonists to go along with them. It was, and for me, it was like uh, it was like a dream come true just to be able to, to do that. I would have loved to have done more uh, after that, but I just got back to the book world. Amazing. Indeed. Well, this is a wonderful time for us to appreciate all that you have contributed to black literature uh, and and really celebrate the fact that you've got a new book. So people need to understand. It, well, one of the things that irritates me is always when people have favorite authors or favorite musical artists and they go, you know, what? why haven't I heard from X, Y, and Z? It's because they haven't right. done the work. So we have been able, we're, we're happy to have been able to bring your voice to them and right. let them know if they have some books they need to catch up on then they can start with the newest one and work their way backwards but they need to know that you've been here and oh, you have been writing I'm here. and they I'm need here. to continue to support and, 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 book, and please, they, uh, they can pop out to www.ericjeromedickey.com uh, to see the entire backlist everything I've done uh, what's coming out next uh, anything that I've uh, Maybe, maybe a link to a short film that I did out there pretty soon. Uh, just, you know, I, I, I stay busy. I mean, uh, I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. Uh, yeah. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's not often that you stumble into something or start something that you really feel like this is what I'm supposed to do with my calling. It's, uh, I haven't, I haven't felt like I've had a job since, for, for, for since 1996. But I work harder than I did when I ever worked for anyone else because I'm working right. myself. Well, we wish you much continued success, and we really thank you for getting up early and joining us on the air today. Thanks for having me on the air. Thank you, and I'm loving the jazz. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, no. I was going to say, and we only have a few minutes left, Mike, oh, yeah, but, yeah. but, you know, just wanted to thank did, you we, again thank for you, great uh, guests. Yeah. Absolutely, and we both had a chance to see the Avengers movie. Any, yes. Any quick thoughts? I, uh, no, oh, I, I, I've oh. told people. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I was going to say, Eric's still online. We're not spoiling it, but we just don't yeah, see I, it. I was going to say, I can't. 
th- there's nothing there's, yeah, there's nothing I can say about the film that will not spoil it for other people who are going to go see it. So I just recommend, ladies and gentlemen, if you are not going to see it this weekend, opening weekend, yeah, Twitter put mute put mute put filters on all of your social media because otherwise people are going Twitter's to gonna, they, yeah, this it's impossible any mo any, avoid it. There's a lot of it's if you're very, not gonna see it. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely agree on that. And then also, um, Chris Rock has a new movie with Adam Sandler on Netflix and. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, Cappuccino. We need to get, bring that back out on Blu-ray. Eric. That's <laughs> oh, one of my favorite I'll movies. I will message Craig on that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, we we, we discussed it um, when when he had the screening. But and you need to you need to sell one a few of your books to to movies as well because we need more romances and love stories. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm working on I'm working on it as well. We're working on that as well, starting with the novel okay. One Night, and uh, then I'm gonna try to. I've got interest uh, in uh, the other woman. And I'm, I may look at Friends and Lovers after that. So Beautiful, beautiful. Thank Excellent. You. Well, we're out of time, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank each of you who have come out and who have uh, tweeted and texted everything that you've done in support of our Forward Spring membership drive. We are packing up our broadcast table here at Duafe and the Sable Collective, but that doesn't mean you can't come out and still take advantage of all the wonderful products that they are selling. Support this black business in our community and you can still put down the source on Friday and Stephanie Renee is your favorite host and continue to begin or renew your forward membership throughout the day online calling our business line at 215-425-7875 and being a part of this initiative going through Monday the end of the month uh, we want you to support black businesses in all of their forms real black yeah you got to renew yeah renew your membership for word Uh, our memberships won't start until September but if you're into Avengers, there's two events. One tonight at uh, uh, Amalgam, Amalgam, and then also on Sunday at the African American Museum, I think 4 p.m. I think it's $5 to get into that one. And then also the film festival is in town. So you have Blind Spotting tonight, and you also have a, a documentary about Andre, uh, I forget. Uh, the, Andre Leon Talley. Yeah, yes. so check check that out on film filmadelphia.org. That's all I got to say. Yeah, plenty going on. Make sure you are out. Brother Shamari is coming up next. Be a part of all of the wonderful programming that exists on Word Radio. Thank you to our team here for a successful live broadcast. We're sending you back to the studio for the Brother Shamari Show. And until next time, peace. <laughs>